began to look at this on Friday, I think, and uh, today we want to expand on that. There will be a third point that we will work more fully on on um, Friday. The parable further explained brings us to a point of application. But today we want to revisit the principles that our master is laying out in the area of hearing and understanding. So if you will, turn in your Bible first and foremost to Matthew chapter 13. And uh, we will do as we often do, go through a number of verses and think about what they mean in relationship to our calling to heed, hear, heed and respond to the word of God. Let me open us in a word of prayer and then we'll commence. Father, we thank you for your kindness. Uh, glad to be uh, of health and strength, to be able to move, be mobile physically and to be able to gather. Thank you for the people of God who have come out. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you help us to hear your word tonight and to take it to heart as Mary did and to take it heart to heart as David did and take it to heart as all of your people did. May it do in us what you have designed it to do, and that is to cause us to take root downward, bear fruit upward, in order that you might be glorified. We come to you on the grounds of your son, his shed blood, which is our cleansing, purging, and washing. We come to you on the grounds of his righteousness, which is our only standing before you. We come to you on the behalf of the body of Christ around the world. We come to you on the behalf of humanity, mankind, in need of a savior, in need of a redeemer, and in need of the light of your word, given the uh, agenda that is taking place these days around the world to, uh, to subdue humanity and make them slaves of an a antichrist system that could never ever bring about life or our, our prosperity or blessing, we would ask, oh God, that you would open their eyes that they might behold the wonder that is in you and in your son and may be drawn to you and up out of the darkness that is planned against them and that is planned against your people. Again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your son. Father, we thank you for the people of God. Give us grace to love you and give us grace to love one another. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. amen. Um, as we prepare, I just want to kind of just give a note. We will be back on Thursday, Lord willing. And we will start at 530. That's for those of you watching us online as well. 530 promptly. Um, the uh, class will be very powerful, very poignant in addressing two matters. The uh, <clears throat> the expose of the Veritas uh data that I sent out to you guys, the Ver Veritas film, exposing how the medical industry works. And then we will be dealing with um, the ineffectiveness and harm that masks do. That will be at 530. Because the films are short, we'll be able to get into our Q&A and work through that a whole lot more. Looking forward to that time. So just want to let you know, 530 to about 730 on Thursday. Um, we uh, we left off last time thinking about what was meant when our Lord laid out the parable in verses one through eight of Matthew chapter 13. And then we began to look at it more intently as we have it under point number one. I called your attention to the explanation. So in Matthew's account, Christ declares the parable of the sower and the seed. That's verses one through eight. That's a declaration. And then in verses 18 through 23, he explains it. So we have it like this. Point number one, the parable expressed. Point number two, the parable explained. And one of the things we did in opening, we took our time and worked through two very critical words. The first word that we worked through was the word hearing. Hearing. This is what you see over in verse nine again. Very important. He who hath ears to hear let him hear. Whenever you hear the phrase let, that's actually an Old Testament, New Testament overlap, and it's an imperative. It's really a command. It's the terminology in the book of Genesis when God is speaking uh, uh, by divine fiat, uh, ex nihilo. He speaks, into th speaks things into existence, and you will hear him say, let there be light. Um, that kind of phraseology is really a divine authoritative mandate. And so it is here. The one who has ears to hear, do what? Let him hear. That's an imperative. That's not a suggestion. That's not 
a uh, an offer, an invite, it's an imperative. And then we see this phraseology uh, over in verse 18 as the parable is about to be explained. He says in verse 19, rather, oh uh, yeah, verse 18, the first part, hear ye, therefore, the parable of the sword and the seed. So we, we were able to understand this in the uniqueness of its uh, Greek term, which has an actual um, English equivalent to it, akuo, akuo. And remember what we learned that word was in English? Acoustics, acoustics. And so we talked about how that hearing required the kind of attention that a person who would recognize the acoustics in a building. They would recognize the tone and the quality. They would recognize the duration of the sound. They would recognize if the sound was muffled or if the sound was crisp. And the, it, the idea with that is that their hearing is keen. Their hearing is keen. They're not dull of hearing. They're not slow of hearing. This is going to be our study more particularly on Friday. They're not dull of hearing. They're not slow of hearing. They're very keen in their hearing. And, and children of God, I will tell you that that is the consequence of an exercise. To be keen of hearing is an exercise. It's not a natural qualitative gift. It's something that requires the discipline of paying attention. Remember, uh, paying attention, P-A-T-H, paying attention to him is the way we did it in the acronym. And for a believer to have keen hearing is for the believer to be one, interested in the things of God, interested. We talked about how that meant to enter in and to rest and to actually resonate with the topic. In fact, it really means to enter in and to uh, understand that topic in a way where you can take it apart so that you can actually see that topic for what it is, that subject for what it is. To, to pay attention then means that we value what we heard, value it. That's what the parable is going to be explaining to us. Uh, some who valued it at one level and others who valued it at another level. The question would be, do we value any time God's word goes forth? And the second term that we saw, which is laid out in the parable as what I consider the distinctives of the parable is seen in verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and what's the term? Understands it not. Jesus now is going to, our master now is going to talk about those who do not understand it. And then what you see over in verse 23, again, is uh, fairly clear. In fact, explicitly clear. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that first hears the word and then what? Understands it. So the good ground hearer, which will develop on Friday, has both keen hearing and good what? Understanding. Good understanding. Now, what did we say understanding really meant in that context in terms of its uh, breakdown in the grammar? It literally means to put things together, to put together. That's literally what it means. A person that understands something is able to put it together. I use the analogy of a child who is being taught the fundamentals of uh, of reading and writing and and uh, phonics, uh, how to recognize letters and how to recognize words and how to express words. The phonetic structure of being able to do that allows you to move to the level of not only hearing, but also speaking. So a person can't speak unless he hears. And in order to speak, you have to know how to take things apart and put things back together. So there is a form of hearing and seeing and then handling language in order to understand it, in order to communicate it. That's how our children are. So we have in our school systems a call, it's called a look-see system. They look, they see, and then they say. They look, they see, and then they say. Now the importance about what I'm talking about is that this is an exercise. It's something you have to do a lot. I was talking about Craig, about a test that he's taking here as an engineer. And he was talking about how he had great dexterity of, um, of discipline in his earlier days as a young man when it came to reading books and preparing for tests. When you get older, you lose that elasticity. You lose that dexterity. But that's not because you're old. It's just because you're lazy. 
It's not because you're old. We blame a lot of things on old. It's because we're lazy. And here's how we can know this. It's not an admonition unless you want to take it that way. Um, it's simply that we fail to recognize that growth really starts with the mind, how we think. And this is what I've been pushing us at Grace for a while to, to keep in view that you really want to be a good thinker. And to be a good thinker requires tools that help you uh, develop the elasticity of your scope of analysis, your scope of assessment, and then methods by which you can assess the important things, deconstruct them, put them back together, and then organize them. And the outcome of that kind of exercise should be wisdom. We're not seeking to acquire knowledge for knowledge's sake. Knowledge does what? Puffs up. It's love that edifies. So we want a knowledge that is a consequence of a discipline that results in wisdom, which is the same thing as understanding in the Bible, okay? When you read the Proverbs, there is an overlap between the word wisdom and understanding. We could start in Proverbs 4. We're not going to do it for time's sake. But remember, a man or woman of understanding is more likely to be a man or woman of wisdom than a person that's merely a man or woman of knowledge. And the difference is that what we have been able to do by the uh, by the discipline of hearing, hearing a wise man hears and will increase in learning. Proverbs nine, my wise men are women. And so when we come to understand, as I stated, we can stand under that proposition. We can stand under that proposition. And that means two things. We can trust it. To stand under something is to trust it. And we can support it. To stand under something becomes now a kind of pillar where you can support it. My Bible is sitting on top of a podium. That podium is standing under my Bible. So when you and I comprehend things, we are able to stand under it, to trust it as being true and helpful, and to support it as a means of offering it to others. That's what understanding is designed to be. So I wanted to reiterate that for us as we prepare to move forward in our study. And, and to do this, I want to share with you a, a testimony that I received from a dear friend who has been a uh, part of my ministry probably now maybe 20 years uh, and they were writing me today thanking me for um, for for my labors in the gospel and they were um, admitting that uh, a, a lot of the material that I've been actually uh, handing out and dis dispensing to everybody about where we are in this battle around COVID has been overwhelming. Now, this individual is a believer rooted and grounded in Christ and part of a good gospel fellowship. And her response was one that I thought was so insightful because what I get is what you're going to learn in the parable of the sower and the seed. In the parable of the sower and the seed, you just have people who don't endure. It's only the fourth soil that endures. And so here's what she said. I'll just share this with you. And you will already know some of this truth uh, in part. Um, they made mention of having just listened to Dr. Pilevsky and, and uh, Gail and Donna in one of the videos we sent out. Uh, and, she, and she said, I don't think I could have appreciated it as much because of your diligence in keeping us informed. And I am remembering these things that they are talking about, taking notes. And it is the be and it's beginning to make sense and dislodging the confusion that has been devastating to me. Did y'all get that point? She said, because I have been uh, given all of this data by you and because I've stayed with it, I've watched it and read it and have taken notes. What has begun to occur is she's now able to take apart the voluminous information that is so overwhelming to most people because they don't discipline themselves in the area of hearing. Again, mark what she says, because this is where we're going in our study. She said, because of your diligence in keeping us informed, that is just simply giving you tools. She said, uh, uh, I am able to begin to make sense of what I'm hearing by dislodging the confusion that has been devastating to me, uh, which would in time past, she said, cause me not to make decisions. 
I would just kind of sit there in paralysis, not knowing which way to go. Uh, but to know why I have made the decision now. Uh, and then she began to talk to me about um, other things with regards to people, family members in the military. But I, I wanted to highlight that note because she's a sister that will quickly tell you that she doesn't learn easy. I remember hearing her say this over the last 10 or 15 years, Pastor Jesse, I'm just a slow learner. And this is where I would say to you and I all the time, we're all what by nature? Slow. Right. Slow. So that really is no excuse because this young lady has been through war on her own. She can tell you what she's been through, her husband, her kids, all that. And here she is in the midst of something that is very diabolical among us. And it's very hard to understand it unless you focus, unless you have the tools, you cannot understand what's going on. But I just wanted to share that because here's what our Lord said. The kingdom of God is a mystery. So when you're talking about talking to unsaved people about the kingdom of God, they don't get it. They don't get it at all. And the notion that they should get it belies that you don't understand that the nature of the kingdom of God is by its own genre and quality complex. Biblical truth is complex. It has to actually be interested in. You have to be interested in truth. And then you have to be disciplined to stay at it long enough to learn how to find the ABCs and the fundamentals of its doctrinal truths and then practice again and again, taking things apart and putting things together, taking things apart and putting things together until you develop a competency in making right choices about what becomes important to you in terms of the word of God. This is how we acquire unto wisdom. So having stated that, what we want to do at this time is just look once again at point number one, briefly, uh, the parable expressed and then tap into point number two, just a little bit more. So in the point number one, notice what I say. And this is in verse 19. Uh, you may not have had that in your outline, but you can mark that. It does not automatically grant understanding. The parable that's set forth concerning the sword and the sea, just because the word is preached, it does not automatically grant understanding. Didn't we learn that? And that's that's what we would get out of verse 19 when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. So on the one hand, they had the echo of the word. That's called acoustics. They had the echo of the word, but the word did not actually take on any kind of clarity or development of understanding in them for a lot of reasons of which we'll take up on Friday. But what we learned on two, uh, on last Friday was that they allowed the birds of the air to swoop down and take up the seed, did they not? So the birds of the air captured the seed of the word of God before it could take root in their heart. And because it didn't take root in their heart, it never could develop into an understanding that would express itself in a saving knowledge of God. So again, that needs to be looked at more fully on Friday and we'll look at it. We'll touch on it a bit today. The second one, just because the word of God is preached, it does not automatically grant what? Regeneration. It doesn't grant renewal. This is what we saw over in verse 22. And he also, uh, verse 20, uh, yeah, verse 22, we can see it here. He also, um, mm, let me see here. Is that the one that I want to work on? Yeah. Look at verse 21 and 22. Uh, verse 20 and 21, I'm sorry. But when he that received the seed in stony ground, the same as he that hears the word with on and, with, and, and on and by and by, with joy receives it, yet he hath no root in himself. And that's going to be the key point. If there's no root, there's going to be no life. Uh, but he but he endures for a while for when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word's sake, he is by and by what? Offended. Offended. So we're going to be talking on Friday about the absence of the root means the presence of offense that results in people departing from the gospel. That would make sense in terms of the metaphor, because I'm teaching you guys about how Christ is the tree and you and I are a tree. Right. So if you have a root, when the wind blows, you won't be moved. But if you have no root or your roots are dislodged because you're a dead tree, when the wind blows, you're going to topple over. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. But we want to look at that more particularly. Uh, number three, just because the word is preached, it does not automatically grant what? Fruitful sanctification. 
And this is something we want to investigate a little bit more fully on Friday as well. And this is what we get in verse um, 22. And he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes what? All right, so this is really interesting. Again, I'm going to deal with this in terms of the grammar and the implications of what Christ is saying on Friday. He actually becomes unfruitful. You know what that means? He appeared to be fruitful early on, and then over time, he became unfruitful. Now, that's a really interesting dynamic. And again, we'll talk about the metaphor of that as having early fruit, but not full fruit and not lasting fruit. When Jesus said in John 15, I have ordained you. You did not ordain me. I chose you. You did not choose me. And I chose you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should what? Remain. So when one is actually operating out of submission to the spirit of God at length, the kind of fruit the spirit of God bears in our life should be lasting fruit. So we'll be talking about the difference between temporary fruit in the life of the false prophet and the wicked and lasting fruit in the life of the regenerate uh, and, and, and the true preachers and teachers of God. That's extremely important for us to consider. And then lastly, under point number one, the parable expressed, we see that it does, however, grant what? A witness and a response. So now, if the word of God is um, salient to you, if it signals importance, Isaiah 55 is going to make that clear. His word will not return void. It will do that which is said it would do wherever it's sent. It will not return void. But what you may not presuppose with that is that everywhere the word of God goes, it's designed to save. That's not the presupposition that you should infer from that. God's word does not always go out to save. In fact, the parable that Jesus here is teaching, remember, he gives the qualifier. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them that are without, all these things are done in parables in order that they would not see. So I just want you to know that if you establish the assertion that any time God's word is preached, it's designating for the purpose of saving someone, you're not on the same page with God. And we need to know that that is um, that is inconsistent with the tenor of scripture. The word of God is a two edged sword. It saves and it kills. And the fundamental factor between those two edges is really the attitude and disposition of the heart of the person hearing okay and so keep that in mind now what i want to do is go to point number two because our time flies when we're enjoying ourselves and this is called the parable what so we've been looking at the parable express we just been scratching the surface i want to touch on why um in points one two three and four we had, uh, it doesn't automatically grant understanding, grant regeneration, grant fruitfulness, nor does it automatically, um, nor, but it will always bear a witness and a response. That's what Romans 10, 17 through 21 says. So now look with me carefully at point number two. We'll walk through this. Because point number two is laying out for us the, uh, the expression of uh, verse 19. When the text says, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then comes the wicked one and catcheth away that which is sown in his heart. This is he which see, receives seed by the wayside. Do you guys see that? Here's what I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, recommend to you that that process occurred because the word of God was not important to him. Do you see sub point A under point number two? Notice what it says. He does not understand its what? Importance. He does not understand its importance. So the way to understand a wayside hearer, uh, and the analogy is that of the seed being sown by the sower. And remember, I told you that Greek term is broadcast, taking the seed and broadcasting. This is what we do on radio. It, we broadcast and we broadcast the seed indiscriminately. But as we're broadcasting the seed, it actually will fall on the path where people just walk in general versus falling on tilled and cultivated soil that has been prepared for easy reception. So there's a difference between the wayside that is untilled and uncultivated and therefore does not have easy reception. Did you guys capture those three versus the soil that has been turned up? 
followed and cultivated and prepared for what we call easy reception. Easy reception. So there's the person who doesn't receive the word of God because the heart is not prepared. And then there's the person for whom the word of God is more easily received because a, of a pre preparatory component given to it. This would be the difference between a person who has never heard the Bible at all and has been largely secularized in his life and nothing of the word of God is working in him to soften him to the propositions of biblical truth. Conversely, as we'll see with the other two, that's not the case. With the other two, these are people who are not just around the church, but they're in the church. So there is a cultivation process, a breaking up of the follow ground that's taking place in them. In this person here, here's my argument. In this first soil uh, scenario, because the heart here is being represented by the soil, is it not? The soil is a type of the condition of the heart, condition of the heart. His heart is hard, and because it's hard, he is disinterested. It's important to get this. This is what we're going to lay out here in a moment because of his disinterest because of his hard heart the hard heart is the uh reason for his disinterest the outcome is going to be is he's not going to see that's the same as understand he's not going to understand the imminent importance of god's word the imminent importance of god's word what's the big deal so what? God created the heavens and the earth. So what? Christ was born of a woman made under the law to, to redeem those that are under the curse of the law. That disposition of heart is damning. So I want you to follow this. Not going to be long with this. We'll unpack it a little bit more on Friday because I want to talk about the subtle workings of slothful hearing versus diligent hearing that is rooted in attitude. If my attitude is so what to the word of God, then God's attitude is going to be towards me. So what? Okay. To the froward, he will be froward. So now under point number two, he does not understand its what? He doesn't understand its importance. That's a big difference. So what does the word of God declare in terms of the good news of the gospel? Here's what it declares in Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the dunamis of God. OK, that leads unto salvation to everyone that believes. And so here's the importance of the word of God. It has the capacity to take an unbelieving person and make them a believing person. It has the power to bring a person out of darkness into light and to change their trajectory of eternity. That's how important the word of God is. This is the importance of the word of God that God has brought to humanity a message of redemption and salvation in Jesus Christ. That is the solution to their eternity and their time. That ought to be important to human beings. The nature of the message of the word of God or the word of the kingdom as Christ is using it is that the kingdom of God has come. It's not a far off. It's here. And that if men would hearken to the kingdom of God, all of the benefits and the privileges of the kingdom of God is yours. And that kingdom has all the necessary resources and all of the necessary tools to save you and to bring you to an eternal glory. That's important. And the way that uh, the language says it here in verse 17, and I love this, Romans 1, 17, for therein is the what? Righteousness. The righteousness of God revealed. What's important about that? Without righteousness, there's no relationship with God. And human beings don't have any. So they are in an inextricable bind in that without God bringing righteousness to us, we cannot bring righteousness to God. And therefore, we remain doomed. There's no good news in that. So again, under the first uh, uh, soil condition of the heart being hardened, and therefore they cannot understand what's the big deal about the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus it has the power, the dunamis, to target the malady of the heart and to explode it and to create in it a newness 
a being so that that heart now takes on a revelatory response to the proposition of who God is and what he's done in Christ. This is actually the power of the gospel in the mind being illuminated. The mind being illuminated for all people who are really true believers. The thing that they have come to understand is that there was a real substantial darkness that dominated their thinking, their being, their prejudices, their priorities, their attitude, their conduct. And the light of biblical truth exploded that. It deconstructed them. It took them apart. And then the power of the word of God started putting them back together again as well because it started giving them watch this and understanding all right we'll, we'll talk about that here in a moment so it says for therein is the righteousness of god what reveal from faith to faith and i love that again because i talked to you on sunday about the fallacy of just looking to jesus our master in the objective sense as if the totality of the gospel is wrapped up in him. You would have never ever seen Jesus had it not been other living trees who have been impacted by Jesus impacting you to impact somebody else to impact somebody else. So from faith to faith, from faith to faith, from Christ's faith to his servant's faith, from their faith to other people's faith, from their faith to other people's faith, from their faith to other people's faith. Do you guys see that? From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is important. Here's another truth around the importance of, of this word that this first soil's condition does not see, as understand. It's in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, where Paul also says to Timothy, Timothy, do not shrink away from your trials because that's what we do. We shrink away from our trials. And when we shrink away from our trials, we are indicating a failure to remember the promises of God's word. When we shrink away from our trials, you and I can be sure that we are failing to remember the promises of God's word. He says, but, but be not thou ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Timothy is being told by Paul to not be what Paul has already said in Romans 16. I am not. Paul already said, I'm not ashamed. And literally in the Greek, to be ashamed means to shrink away, to lose a sense of standing where you gradually lose confidence in the message. That's where we are in our world today. In our world today, in most of your communities of faith, they are ashamed of the gospel. Please know that. And you, you don't have to scratch your head a lot. If you and I are trapped by carnal decision making, you and I are practicing shame around the gospel. If you and I are bent on carnal decisions, you and I know this, that we won't be prepared to stand for the gospel because the tenor of those carnal decisions will paralyze our faith. Am I making some sense? All right, so I'm not going to stay on that long. It just you know, always boggles my mind when people don't get that. You and I can't practice a carnality and, and, and somehow believe that our faith is going to constantly be buoyed up to make the right decisions in a moment of crisis. It's not going to happen. OK, so this is what is to be understood. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Now, notice the two bookends. This is my argument. Paul is telling Timothy. You might go to jail for the gospel. Just like I am in jail for the gospel. Do you see that? That's my point. That's my very point. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions. Now he's affirming. But you be ready to go to jail. Now, this is where that second soil came in. Remember, with joy, it received the word and was all happy about it. But when trial came, it quickly was offended, scandalized. We'll get into that on Friday. So Paul is telling Timothy, don't be scandalized. Don't be scandalized. It's, if God wants you in prison, there's a purpose there. All right, and then it goes on to say, but be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the uh, power of God. Um, verse 9, now watch this, verses 9 through 11. The God who has what? Saved us and called us with what kind of calling? Right, and so that adjective there is very advised, it's very important because we might accept the fact that we're called. But are we accepting the fact that we are called out? 
I taught us this about three or four months ago. Called, called out, called unto, and called up. Do you remember that when I taught the rapture? So if a believer uh, is a saying that he has heard the call, he has to know that the prepositions are is that he's called out. So called out of what? Well, the Bible's clear. Then not only is he called out, he's called unto. Well, called unto what? The Bible's clear. You should be able to answer those. You should be able to answer what you have been called out of, what you have been called unto, what you have been called into. And that in being called out unto, into, you're being prepared to be called up. You guys got that? I'm not going to revisit that study because I do this stuff for you guys all the time. It should be right there on your lips, right there in your heart. He doesn't just call you out. You are not meandering in the world. God calls you unto himself. That's the ultimate destiny of the believer. But from being called out unto himself, there are those steps again, called, called out, called unto, called into, right? Called into. Very important to get this with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which means I need to know God's purpose. I also need to know his grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. When? In other words, God planned our eternal destiny outside of ourselves in the person of Christ, apart from our works on the grounds of his grace in order that you and I might be with him. But the process of being with him starts with a call, a call out, a call unto, a call into and a call upwards. That's the process of all people of God. Verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Jesus appeared in the first century where Paul and them works. He was the word made flesh dwelling among them. And Jesus became the message. Was he not the message? So I want you to hear this statement. This is what's important about this first point. He's made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus, who had abolished death. Is that important? Watch this. And hath brought life. Is that important? And added to that immortality. See what I mean by the importance? See what I mean by the importance? So if a man or woman hears the gospel and does not hear the importance of Jesus coming to abolish death, to bring life, and then to bring immortality, watch this, to light. Bring it to light. Now, this is interesting because what is clearly implied by this proposition is that there is no other light in the world that can bring us to the knowledge of the abolishing of death and the bringing in of eternal life and immortality. But the gospel, the gospel alone cuts the lights on to God's eternal purpose in Christ and reveals to us how death is abolished, how life is brought to the dead sinner, how immortality is the promise of the living sinner. And that's brought to light through the word of the living God. This is why there are Christians all over the planet from the days of Adam to now because that message of the gospel centered in Jesus has done this. It has abolished death. All of the typical patterns of the Old Testament represented in the slaughtering of the lambs, putting an end to death. All of the typical pictures of the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection of men and women in the Old Testament rising from the dead. All of the pictures of men and women living in the framework of the kingdom of God and God blessing them and God watching over them and God using them and them overcoming all that they did. This is what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 11 is brought to light. Through the what? Through the gospel brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So under point number one, its importance is that it has the power to save you and bring us into this glorious knowledge. You can go out and talk to 100 people tomorrow and you won't meet one out of that hundred who can tell you why the word of God is important. 
All right, let's go to the second one because I want us to just tap on this. I just wanted to nurture this. The parable explained. He does not understand it's important. So the wayside hearer doesn't see the significance of the gospel until something happens to him. Sub point B, he does not understand it's what? All right. So I want to touch on this quickly. This is the way that everything is like if you uh, if you become curious about uh, cars and you have a particular car in mind, do you know that that car has a nature? If you become curious about a discipline or field that you want to get into, let's say you want to get into the medical field. God help us. But if you want to get into the medical field, you need to know that the medical field has a nature. If you want to get into the educational field, it has a nature. If you want to get into the industry of, of agriculture or horticulture, it all has a nature. And you need to know the nature. If a man or woman becomes interested in the word of God, what they need to know is the word of God has a nature. And here's the nature that this particular word has. It has the nature of actually offending people. You can write that down. The word of God has this nature. It has the nature of offending people. So again, that's where in the parable of the uh, sower and the sea, he hath no root in himself, but he endures for a while. But when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, by and by, he is what? He's offended. He's offended. And then the same thing is true with the, he also receives seed among thorns. Is he that hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke that word. Now, this is what we will be unpacking on Friday because of the nature of the word. John, Luke chapter 7, 23, if you can keep up with me for a few verses, Luke 7, 23 kind of gives us a hint there in relationship to this. Although you guys can find this in many places uh, of the scripture. Here's what Jesus said. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended. Where? All right. So now you notice what he just said. If you find Jesus intriguing, if you find him curious, if you find him interesting and you find yourself wanting to hang out with him, you will be blessed if you can hang in there and not be offended by Jesus. So what I'm saying to you is, and a lot of Christians don't get this. The word of God is offensive. Particularly the prophetic word. It's not only offensive to people out there, it's offensive to people in the church. It's offensive to you and me, and it's definitely offensive to us when we forget our identity in Christ and are operating out of carnal tendencies. Does that make sense? Yes. This is why, as we'll unpack on Friday, and he that received the word in shallow ground is the person that's rejoicing, but the cares of this life, the cares of this life, the cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of this world system that individual thinks he can have both this world and Christ too without ever going through processes of separation or categorization or as we were learning in Romans 8, mortification. The person that thinks they can have Christ and have everything in this world too, friends, relationships, material things, fails to understand the nature of God's word. Are you hearing me? Fails to understand. And this is why, for the most part, what people do is they hop and skip and jump over the Bible verses. I taught you all that, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? That's what they do. They, we don't want to face the totality of Scripture and its authority and its insightfulness to expose us to our love for this world. And that's the nature of the word of God. And so we'll unpack that more fully. But look, Jesus plainly said it. And blessed is he who shall not be offended where? Right. Well, watch this. The disciples were offended in him. That final night that the enemy smashed the shepherd, the sheep scattered. Jesus was, a, uh, uh, Peter was offended. I don't know him. This is why a true believer does not have to get all beside himself when he loses friends, even particularly Christian friends, if he's right or if she's right. And they they want to distance themselves from you because you are taking a stand for Christ. And Jesus will let you know, listen, the servant is not greater than the master. If I took these hits, you're going to take these hits, too. 
Because that's the nature of God's word. And see, sometimes Christians really struggle with being rejected and really struggle with being uh, maligned. They really struggle with people censoring you as you know how this whole pseudo uh, relationship on Facebook and, 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 and social media is. It's a, it's a false friendship world. Do you know that? It's not a real world of friends. It's an amazing thing. I shouldn't slide over into that parenthetical, but I just like to because I, I like for you to get it. I like for you to get this. That world was created to separate you from the real world of real friends. Okay? That world was created to separate you from the real world of real friends. It's, it's amazing because the whole world has now been subsumed up into that social, social media world to well, where they know actually how to control the masses of the world and force them to make decisions based upon social media. So most people are already um, avatars and cyborgs of the social media uh, uh, conglomerate. Most people think in terms of the authority and influence and sway of social media. Also, what that means, if you don't get it, is this. The men and women that are immersed in social media as their life don't know how to think actively and don't know how to think dynamically. And therefore, they are not good at all at real ontological organic relationships. My son is in college right now finishing up his chemistry degree. That's Nate. That's why you won't see him for a while with music. He just started his, uh, his, um, his orientation up at Davis. And what he said was Davis is like a, 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 a vast group of young and middle-aged uh, students who are like zombies. So, you know, Nate's been in the gospel, deeply in the gospel, so his eyes are open, plus he's older, so he's more mature than many of them. You would know what I'm talking about, Pat. Uh, those young people are largely in a daze. They are trapped by uh, the inability to distinguish between reality and the... Uh, figmentation of the actual borders and parameters of the Davis College school system because it's structured just like the Marxist system that we're trying to overcome. It's structured with the same kind of totalitarian, tyrannical control factors, a mask everywhere. The moment you come out of your room, mask. And you can't go here and you can't go there and you can't do this. The kids are in an absolute... They, they, they can't understand at all how to negotiate that. They are riding their bikes to go to the campus because many of them don't have cars and they're getting hit by cars every day. And that's because they really don't know P-A-T-H. They don't know the path. They don't know how to pay attention. And so they don't know how to distinguish between the hierarchical priority of a 3,000 pound car and a 75 pound bike and a 150 pound human being. And remember, that means we are just as stupid as the squirrel. A lot of kids getting hit. And so Nate is saying, this is really interesting. He says, in a little while, we're gonna see some, uh, some expected negative reactions in about a couple months when they kind of loosen the reins and the kids go to party and then they, they're going to just get just tad all up because they already know the algorithms. They know how to make people act certain ways. We're no different. And that's because we don't drink deeply enough of the word of God for our conscience and our cognition to be healthy in its separation from the influence of the world. The stats are already in. I can tell you that now the stats are in. And so Christians are in a lot of trouble today because they don't think well. And this is, I'm just going to be honest with you, this is my burden with us. We don't think well. And so we're operating in lockstep in a lot of ways with the whole world system. Jesus said, blessed is he that is not offended in me. i got a few more minutes. I can tap into John chapter 661. You guys remember this. And then it closes in 663. Jesus knew this was happening. This is your, this is your epic event where Jesus woke up one morning realizing that he had tens of thousands of people following him because he was popular. And he knew they were coming because he was doing miracles. 
And he intentionally on this day did not cater to their greed or their superficial need. On this day, he told them he was the bread of life, not his capacity to make bread. Now, that proposition would actually withhold from these people the carnal lust that drove them to believe that Jesus was simply a handle you could pull down and cash in on the blessings. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit let this thing grow to tens of thousands. And on this day, Jesus preached the doctrine of the sovereignty of God and the election and choosing and calling of sinners and let everybody know no one can really come to me except my father, which sent me drew, draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. And except you be drawn to my father, you will not receive me as the bread of life. And at that point, many of them were offended and went their way. And then Jesus turned to the 12 and said, will you be offended also? They weren't offended on that day, but they were offended later because that's the nature of the word of God. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples did what? Murmur. Murmured at it. He said unto them, does this offend you? Sound like Pastor Jesse, doesn't it? All right. That's called love. I don't care what you say. That's called love. I don't care what you say. That's called love. That's called love. So you notice what Jesus Christ did? He checked their disruption of thought. Remember, I told you, you only grow if you're disrupted. But if in your disruption, you try to put yourself back together and not allow yourself to crash under the revelatory work of a truth that's designed to actually shift you up out of fallacy thinking, because they were operating out of fallacy thinking too. Do you know what they were operating out of? The idea that Jesus would ascend to the throne in Zion and they would ascend with him and they had no cru cross, uh, cross or crucifixion theology, no suffering theology. They didn't know anything about humility. They had no idea in, them, in themselves that the way up is what? Down. So Jesus started crashing their presuppositions right then and there. He busted their bubbles a lot. He, and from here, he would do it even more significantly because he would take Peter because Peter still didn't get this lesson. And Peter would say, Lord, we're not going to let you go to the cross. And Jesus rebuked Satan right behind Peter because Satan is getting at, at, uh, at Peter and causing him to make carnal choices, right? That if Peter had his way, Jesus would have never went to the cross. And if Christ had never went to the cross, we would never be saved. All because of man-centered thinking on the part of human beings' part. You guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's very, very important for you and I to know that the nature of God's word that is designed to offend you and me so that it can disrupt our presuppositions, our assertions. If you're going to hold a view, you've got to be able to make sure your view stands across the spectrum of God's word. You've got to know that. You've got to know that. And so Jesus checks them on that. Look at verse 66. Got a couple more and then we're done. Verse 66, John 6, 66. From that time, many of his disciples did what? And walked no more with him. Look at that optic. Tens of thousands of people are coming to the fanfare of this big prophet, preacher, miracle worker. On this day, he probably cut down the attendance by three, by three quarters of a percent. 75%. So now everybody else is on alarm. Do you know why? Because we love to find security in numbers. So now 75% of these folks are gone. Now as he keeps going in the same direction, it's a whole lot less. A whole lot less. And so you know how that goes because you're a human being too. Now as y'all walking up and down the different roads, y'all can hear yourselves talking. Before it was so crowded and the buoyancy of the crowd and all of the laughter and the fun that we're having. Now, all of a sudden, it's, it's thinned out to the degree that you feel vulnerable. Does that make sense? Sure, you're vulnerable because now you're more visible because we can hide in the crowd. And more visibility demands what we're going to look at next and close out until Friday greater allegiance, 
greater allegiance. Look at our next one. Here it is. Watch this. In sub point C, sub point C. In sub point C, he doesn't understand it's what? Right. So he doesn't understand its importance. He doesn't understand its nature. He doesn't understand its allegiance. Again, look at verse 22. We're almost done, and it's great, perfect timing. He also received seed among the thorns. Uh, is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches do what to the word? That's absolutely phenomenal. Choke it. So we'll get a, can we'll get a chance to work on that on Friday. It's important for you to see it. Here's the text, Matthew 10, 24 through 28. This is where Jesus also is moving towards uh, Jerusalem and he's letting his disciples know that if you don't understand the cost of allegiance to me, that th this is going to be a real problem for you. A real problem if, you, if we don't understand the cost of allegiance. The disciple is not above his master. Do you see that? Right, and that can make no sense to any of us unless we seriously and comprehensively study who the master is, how the master was, what the master was to his foes, and what the master was to his friends. If we don't study who the master is, how he was, how he was to his foes and how he was to his friends, we can't understand this. Because what Jesus is saying, at best, you're going to experience what I experienced at best. And so you need to know what that is. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant his Lord. And this would indicate two things. I'm being taught of Christ and I'm a slave of Christ. Does that make sense? I'm not a buddy with Christ. He's not my counselor in the psychological sense. He's not my therapist in the sense that I pay him when I want to hear from him anytime I want to hear from him. And that's how a lot of people treat the word of God. Well, I'm going to go to, word of, to the word of God for some therapy. And when I don't need therapy, I'm going to just leave the word of God alone. I'll do my, I can do my own thing until I'm not feeling good. Then I want Jesus to heal me. Right. That, nowhere in the Bible does it construct the notion of a relationship of a blood-bought child of God as merely having a, uh, a business relationship with Jesus of convenience. Notice verse 25. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. Now here, this is talking about what we're going to see on Friday, the impact of the seed of the tree being planted in you and replicating in you what the tree is by nature. Ontologically, the tree is who? Replicationally, the seed produces other trees like it. This is called the idea of the seed bearing herb. Kind. So what Jesus is saying is my tree, my fruit is good. My seed is good. When I'm done working, you're going to be like me. That's what he's saying. And if, if it's not, then Jesus is not working. All right. So it's important to get it's enough for the disciple to be as his master. If they have called the master of the house, what? Right. So I'm dealing with some people right now that might be the end of my uh, at the end of my uh, radio ministry here in a, in a little while, you can pray for me. I don't really care about it. Another door will open. Other doors are already trying to be kicked open right now anyway. But um, I, I really laugh at how people are predictable in the area of uh, arguments and debates. Like if you really don't know the fundamentals of arguments and debates, uh, then people will say things to you that don't make any sense to you. And you're, you're, you're talking apples and oranges. But for me, I understand arguments pretty well. I understand circular reasoning. I understand uh, uh, when, when people are throwing out what are called Kafka traps. I understand when people are digging holes in the ground and creating rabbit trails. I understand uh, misnomers. I understand non sequiturs. I understand genetic fallacies. All of that kind of stuff has to be understood when people are putting statements out there. And what, ha what happened in Jesus' day is he was constantly actually being attacked ad hominem. These are called ad hominem attacks. And what weak people do is weak people judge an individual based upon an ad hominem attack by somebody else as to whether or not they will hear them. Notice what I just said. Weak people do that. Weak people do that. So always remember this. A proposition stands all by itself as being true and right and worthy of consideration 
even if the devil said it. There is no necessary correlation between the proposition and the entity from which that proposition came in terms of its truth claim. Equally, just because he said it doesn't make him right. Let's call a genetic fallacy if you do that. Here's, let me, can I help you just a tad with that? So we are all operating out of what are called normalcy biases. There are things we're comfortable with and things we like and things we believe. Just because somebody says something you're comfortable with, things you like and things you believe, does not mean that person's an angel. Do you understand what I'm getting at? You're very weak if you think like that. You and I are called to believe in the, in the aletheia, in the veritas, actually, for those of you who know what's going on. The veritas is the exposure of that which really is. And, and that's what a Christian should be pursuing. The veritas of a thing, the truth of a thing. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not just a song. What Jesus says is, test me thoroughly, and as you pull me apart, like you pull an onion, I'm going to be true all the way through. You're not going to find inconsistency in me. Well, a bunch of people alleged to have found inconsistency in him. They called him a wine bibber, a glutton, a for child of fornication, a, a, a sect leader, all kind of things just to keep people from hearing him. OK, so this goes on right now today. This is part of your censorship. This is part of your council culture. This is part of squashing anything that doesn't follow the narrative. Do you understand that? And you have to be able to know when you are hearing something that's telling you to go in a different direction without a legitimate premise under it. Because Jesus is dealing with that. He says, if they did that to me, guess who they're going to do? Isn't that what Paul said? If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, we were called liars, we were called slanderers, we were called evildoers, we were called all kind of wicked things. He said, we don't care anything about that. For us, it was all about the proclamation of the gospel. And the salvation of God's elect. So I, I say that because this is what's going on in the parable. The cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And uh, and then, of course, obviously, this is what I'm going to state. And we'll fill it in next time. The one soil that is received on good ground is he that hears the word. He understands it, which also does what? Bear fruit. Do you see that language? He hears the word, he understands it, he bears fruit. Those are the three things you and I want to be considering this Friday. He hears the word, he understands it, and it also what? Bears fruit and bring forth. Bears fruit and brings forth. Bears fruit and bring forth. One word I want you to get. One word, grow. One word, grow. That's what I want you to get. All right. And then we'll pick it up on Friday and really enjoy um what that means, and, and then I have a fourth point. You don't have it in your outline. The parable further expanded. I'll have that in your outline for Friday.